Legislators in New York are threatening to do the same to another performer who has taken a bold political position. Their target is rock legend Roger Waters and his support for the Palestinian-led boycott, divestment and sanctions movement, or BDS. An opinion piece published on local news in Nassau County this week compared the struggle of musicians censored during the Cold War to that of Waters, stating, the blacklisting of actors, writers, and directors during the Cold War is among the most shameful chapters of American history. Yet, a group of Nassau County legislators appear to favor a revival of a blacklist. They are determined to prevent former Pink Floyd bassist Roger Waters from performing at Nassau Coliseum next month because he has endorsed the goals of the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement. BDS seeks to punish Israel because of its policies towards Palestinians. The piece goes on to point out it was Waters himself who sang famously in Pink Floyd's The Wall the timeless lyric, we don't need no thought control. In an exclusive conversation, I spoke with Waters about attempts to shut down his show for his views on Palestine, but also the current state of politics in the United States and the rise of a modern Cold War. Roger, you are one of, if not the most high-profile supporter of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement in support of Palestinian rights. Legislators in New York's Nassau County are actually threatening to cancel shows of yours uh, for this position you've taken. How is that able to happen? Well, I, d I don't think it is able to happen. Um, but the, the basis upon which it's happening is that they is that the APAC, APAC and the um, Israel lobby in this country tried to pass legislation in the state legislature in New York to criminalize um, membership of or support for boycott, divestment and sanctions. They failed in that endeavor, but Andrew Cuomo, the governor, wrote it into state law as an executive action just on his own as an individual. So there is a law of some kind, which I haven't, I, I can't tell you exactly what it says, but uh, which says that no organization or business is allowed to do business in New York State um, with a person such as me who is involved in the boycott uh, movement to try and encourage the Israeli government to um, modify its uh, policies vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian Let's get into the government, because in defending his band's decision to play in Israel, Radiohead frontman Tom York said, playing in a country isn't an endorsement of the government, pointing out the group doesn't endorse Trump, but still plays in the States. Why is Israel different? That's a two-part question. All right. Um, Tom York is wrong about not endorsing the policies of the Israeli government by playing there. Um, uh, spokespersons of that government have said how excited they are that this is the best thing that's happened for their Hasbara, which is the explaining uh, to the rest of the world what a, uh, what a wonderful and precious democracy Israel is. Um, and willy-nilly, when they cross the picket line, they are making a public statement that they do endorse the policies of the government, whatever they say, because that is what will be reported in Israel, and that is what gets reported around the world. That is why Radiohead are being so uh, soundly criticized by anybody with um, progressive ideas about human rights, um, because they have taken that step. The other thing is about not performing in the United States or trying to boycott the United States. The people of the United States have not got together as a civil society and asked performers from the rest of the world not to come and perform in the United States because they are an occupied people and there is an organized resistance against the occupying army. Civil society in Palestine in 2005 started the BDS movement themselves. This isn't something imposed by a bunch of foreign rock musicians. This is something that they started, that they have organized, and they have made an appeal to all artists, writers, musicians, actors, directors, anybody in the rest of the world to observe the picket line which they have drawn um, and to ask us not to, uh, to, to, to observe a cultural boycott of the country. 
You're one of the most beloved rock stars of a generation. You're very vocal, outspoken, and I would say you're fairly accessible. Why don't we hear from you on mainstream media or on popular late night television shows? I'm told that they can't answer that question, but that it comes from above. I was told that by Charlie Rose, not directly, but by his producer. Why isn't Roger on Charlie Rose then? We're not quite sure, but it comes from above. Did that change so after you? So you can figure it out for yourself. It's not rocket science. These are after you took these positions. Um, well, the, I've, I've taken this position since 2006. When, for, it's a long story, but basically it's, yeah, the last 10 or 11 years. And, but it, my presence began to be felt by APAC and by the Israel lobby in this country, which is extremely powerful. As you know, um, they're very, very powerful uh, donors to all political parties. They wield enormous power in Congress, which is why, as we speak, there is a bill before Congress um, that is sponsored by, among others, the junior senator from New York, Kirsten Gillibrand, who I've actually met in the past. I look forward to meeting her again, because um, I want her to explain herself to me. Um, and, the, and the bill is to criminalise BDS with criminal pen, penalties for people like me. There's been even been talk of uh, million dollar fines and 20 years in prison. As a critic of Israel, one of the main uh, campaigns against you, this powerful lobby has rolled out, is to call you an anti-Semite. In the U.S. at the moment, if you question the media's obsession with Trump's ties to Russia, you're called a Putin apologist. If, as a journalist, you challenge the narrative the media is pushing on the war in Syria, you're called an Assadist, why is it uh, when you start to call out injustices or inaccuracies in the status quo, people are immediately slapped with a label? Because we're living in 1984. You know, that, that, when my children were young teenagers, I insisted that they read Brave New World uh, so they, you have to read, all children should read Huxley and Orwell and maybe a bit of Wells. Maybe, maybe if there was something in French. But in fact, that is where we're living now, where, where propaganda is more important than facts, far more important. And that, that is a huge news story now. This whole thing about fake news is that people have understood that the truth Facts, philosophy, knowledge, history, education, none of these things are important. In order to retain a position of power, you need to be really good at propaganda and you need to be really good at telling big lies often and loud. And the last thing that you want on, in the mainstream media is anybody shining actual real light on anything. So people who, are, who, are, who actually care about the predicament of the human race or about the future of this small vulnerable planet or about their fellow human beings and if they're being oppressed or killed or, or, any, or anything like that. It's best to keep them out of the way because they may interfere with the general narrative. You say people are realizing this. This is something I would say you figured out a while ago. You're currently on the Us and Them tour, which is full of uh, especially politically charged visuals. But many of your most well-known songs written decades ago still correspond perfectly with the current state of politics in the United States. One line which comes to mind is, uh, hey, you White House, ha-ha, Sherrod, you are. And we're just a few blocks from the White House right now, Roger. What does it symbolize to you? Um, well, it, it's, it's like a, it's an edifice that now has become symbolic of how detached politics in the United States, but all over the Western world, has become separated from its potential function which was for society, civil society, to organize itself in a way um, that helps society to grow and develop and that protects the um, civil and legal rights of its citizens. Uh, it, is, it is now, the White House is, is an edifice symbolic of the function of government, which now seems to be to protect 
um, the tiny elite of very, very, very wealthy men who actually run this country and the corporations who profit from the policies that are meted out by the Congress that is bought and paid for by the donors who were given um, the, the liberties to make those donations by the Supreme Court in Citizens United, which is one of the most regressive pieces of, of, um, of legal doctrine to have found its way into, the, into society since the Second World War. And it's deplorable in every possible way. It means that you can buy, the whole political system is up for sale because of that one particular law. So in consequence, it's an, it's an absolute, it is a charade. The whole thing is a charade now. It has nothing to do with government of the people, by the people, for the people. There is no longer any safety net. This particular administration it has shown and, and is completely honest about the fact that it wants to dismantle all humane federal governmental um, agencies to look, that look after the environment, the old, the sick, the aged, any poor, anybody poor, anybody. They, they need to be destroyed on the altar of the advance of the corporations. And, if, if what I was saying wasn't true, it would sound crazy, but it's not, it's actually true. So that must be kept from the public, it has to be kept off the mainstream media. We must, we must not talk, we can't talk about it, like we Palestine. And you wrote that song 40 years ago, but in much of the establishment's criticism of Trump, we hear the phrase, that I hear it all the time, and uh, particularly liberal media, this is not normal, that somehow Trump is more authoritarian or militaristic, brutish than anyone else who's ever run this country or been involved in politics. Do you think Trump really represents something unique in the United States? Only because he's supremely dumb. You know, he's he, he, he is a nincompoop, and he, self evidently, and he, and he, he kind of profess, professes that publicly all the time with his tweets and, and just generally with the way he behaves and whatever. North Korea best not make any more threats to the United States. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. So, so he, he is like, he's different than Obama was, or even than Clinton. They were much smoother operators. Though. But they were still operating policies which are fundamentally wrong and inhuman. And particularly in their waging of war against the rest of the world. You know, the, this idea that um, the United States needs to be a military presence over the whole globe and needs to be... Um, uh, threatening as much as it can and controlling as much as it can. And, um, it's deeply and desperately dangerous, particularly in the world we live in, where we still, after all these years, have countries that have nuclear weapons. So that we, we could, you know, we could be sitting here talking, and what a surprise it will be if there's a whoomph and all the lights go out because of some electromagnetic thing, and then suddenly we realize it happened. Wow, and it's what we've all been talking about. And the wise men have all been warning us for years and years and years. Just last week they came out and they said the doomsday clock is at two and a half minutes to midnight. This is the closest we've been to the nuclear catastrophe since the end of the Second World War. And, and, and yet, what do we talk about? Well, we talk Russia about, Gate? We talk about heightening tensions with Russia. Well, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, and it, and it's why you know why you ha you have to ask yourself why why would we why would we do that? Why would John McCain want to be going and having a war with Russia? Why would we be wanting to have more and more boats in the Black Sea or wherever they are? Why why this obsession with with Russia? Why not? Why not? Maybe that maybe that's the only tiny bit of sense that Trump has made is that. It might be a good idea to actually have conversations with the Russian. The guy, I can't remember his name, but the foreign minister seems to be eminently sensible and eloquent. Lavrov. Yeah. And also people, people I think, would do well to um, re-go over the interviews that Oliver Stone did with Putin. Because when you actually listen to it, if you, if you would compare uh, Vladimir Putin with Donald Trump, you go, which man would you rather sit down and have a conversation with? 
there's, there's no credit. This one's a complete buffoon who doesn't make any sense, knows nothing about anything. This guy may be power hungry, and he may be, but at least he's at least he's coherent. At least he can string a sentence together. At least he at least he reads about the political situations in the places that um, he, his his country is involved in, which are let it not be said, all on his doorstep. Putin is not frigging around in Mexico. He, he doesn't have nuclear missiles just over the Mexican border. So you're obviously not afraid of being called a Putin apologist now like Oliver has been for pointing out these things. No, of course I'm not afraid. It's, it's just the reality of the situation. That, that gets back to the idea that what's important to the mainstream media is propaganda. That, and that's what it's about. It's become a tool of propaganda, maybe unwittingly to some large extent. Finally, uh, you're on the Us and uh, Them tour right now throughout the States and then I believe Europe as well. Uh, for your fans coming to your shows, how would you like them to take your music and translate it, it, translate it into action in their own lives, their role of humans? I hear you talk about that a lot, your role as a human being, uh, especially your fans in Israel who might be wanting to know why they that music can't be played in their country. Well, it'd be very hard for the, not for all Israeli fans because obviously I'm in touch with many of. There is a big, big resistance movement um, in, in Israel. There, there's a particular organisation called Boycott from Within, run by a guy now called Ronnie Bach, and, and they and it's a proper organisation and they're extremely brave because in the face of the intransigence of most of the Zionists. It, in, in Israel, they are actually running their own form of resistance because they are caring um, Jewish people who are deeply distressed that the policies of the Israeli government run contrary to the humane tenets of Judaism and what's actually in the Torah and, and, and what they believe their connection with, with their religion. I'm an agnostic, so it, it's really none of my business, but. Um, we do know that all those Judaic-based religions all have the same basic ideas about them. But you, you asked me something else. In, the, in this, I'll tell you something. We've done 30 gigs in this country, and everywhere we play, because the show is very political, but it, people see it and they understand that it's about us recognizing the predicament of others. It attaches very much to the philosophical position that we should do as we would be done by. A character from Charles Kingsley's Water Babies, Mrs. Do as you would be done by, says that. But we, it, it is incumbent upon us all and upon our politicians and on all those of us who think about people who might be on the other side of an argument to put ourselves in their shoes. How would we feel sitting here in Washington if there were drones buzzing around in the sky all day and we never knew when we were going to be blown out of our socks? Because it, the a drone attacks, for instance, targeted assassinations, of which I have to say I could not have been more disapproving of when, when the last administration was in power. Why Barack Obama kept, continued and expanded that drone program? I will never know. I haven't had the chance to ask him about that, and I probably never will. But I have no idea. It's hard to imagine a sensible reply. I mean, he might say, oh, well, we have to fight terror. Please, you, you, you must see that being that kind of belligerent, bellicose, deadly presence in 137 foreign countries can only encourage a resistance to that to that completely unacceptable colonial and imperialist behavior. It's inevitable. No, you can't cut the head of a state. Anyway, that's a long conversation. And, but what I've found in, the, in, in my shows is that we discover that that 10 or 12,000 people, tiny as that number is, are desperate to find, to be in a, in a, in a place of love for their fellow human beings to support their fellow, if they want to help people, they don't want to be part of this administration's charge towards ripping the rug out from under society as a whole, giving it entirely over to the corporations and the few very, very rich, very, very greedy men who run everything. 
they want to they want there to be a society where they care for their brothers and sisters and they would like that to extend beyond the national borders of the United States not just into Mexico and South America and where Trump thinks the enemy are but also into policies in the Middle East and and all where so that they start addressing the idea that all human beings deserve human and civil rights, including the Palestinians. In fact, from my position as, a, as an active member of BDS, especially my brothers and sisters in Palestine who've been living under military occupation for 50 years, since 1967. And so we, we continue in the struggle, and we're winning it. This is why they call me an anti-Semite. This is why they want to silence me. This is why they don't want me on Charlie Rose or Stephen Colbert speaking. He lets me play my song, but I'm not allowed to sit on the couch and talk because this, you know, because they don't want to hear it. But um, it's spreading, and that's why they're so frightened. 68 years following the Peekskill riots, artists in the United States are still targeted for their political beliefs, now by a powerful lobby in Washington representing the interests of the Israeli government. What's more, seven decades on from the second Red Scare and the beginning of the McCarthy era, a Russian menace still looms in the minds of Washington's political class, and many lawmakers are fixated on escalating with Russia all over again. The threat of mutually assured destruction has yet to temper the bellicose rhetoric from our leaders. Now, as during the original Cold War, it seems that only a handful of artists and thinkers are brave enough to put careerism aside, to lead with their humanity, and to question more.